essence of life is growth beyond where you were today. And as long as you're able to grow, there is everything to look forward to. And it doesn't matter what you do, just grow. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Are you ready to start investing in real estate today, but don't know where to start? Sometimes investing can seem way too complicated, but it actually couldn't be any easier than with homeinvest.com. You know the co-founder and my friend, Nate Armstrong. He appeared on episode 20, and if you haven't heard it, go back and listen to it, episode number 20. Home Invest is a company that allows you to invest in turnkey real estate. Their goal is to build powerful investment tools that make real estate investing accessible to everyone. They have contractors and property managers available for you with the click of your mouse. While other real estate agents can only offer a property, Home Invest brings you a full turnkey package that allows you to diversify your investments, earn passive income, and start building equity in properties. Their simple, intuitive design allows newcomers and experienced investors alike to hit the ground running and to be able to choose the properties when they want and where they want. View easy to understand charts and data to allow you to buy in only a few clicks or just a simple phone call. With Home Invest, you'll be building your portfolio as quickly or as slowly as you would like. And right now, Home Invest is giving our listeners, Pillar of Wealth Creation listeners, a free course on how to finally win in real estate investing. So go to homeinvest.com forward slash pillars. That's homeinvest.com forward slash pillars to claim your free course today. Hey, welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexammer. With me today, I'm excited to have Sam Grooms. Sam, how are you doing? Great, how are you doing? I am fantastic, and I also have Ben Labovich. Ben, did I say your, your name right? You absolutely did, thank awesome. you. Awesome, how are you doing today? Fantastic. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys being on the show and uh, brought both of you on because, well, you're business partners. So we want to want to uh, have you both on, tell us about your experiences, but I'm going to do a short introduction of each of you individually. Then you can kind of expand on that. And then I want to know about um, what your partnership is all about. So uh, first of all, Sam, he's a CPA turned real estate investor, has been doing it for several years, uh, started with the flipping, uh, then doing some passive investing and now he's doing the uh, multifamily syndication. Uh, then we have Ben, and he was a, a violin player diagnosed with MS. And uh, once that happened, started looking for you know what to do in real estate kind of happened. In 2006, started doing some single families, some small multifamilies, and then syndication. So with that, one of you kind of take us uh, – I guess maybe each of you individually take us a little bit about your background and then one of you uh, kind of expand upon what your business is right now. Sam, you want to take it? Sure. So my background is uh, I'm a CPA. I was doing, I worked at Deloitte, I uh, was doing auditing, then went into doing um, the SEC reporting for a $3 billion public company here in Arizona. Um, and I started flipping on the side. Um, actually started doing a, basically a live and flip. And that's how I started, liked it, started flipping on the side. Um, liked it so much, I left my career. Uh, my wife left her career, we started flipping. Um, but we still had a job and we wanted to start investing as well. And so we started investing passively in multifamily, um, other basically other syndications, um, in crowdfunding and local syndicators here in Phoenix. Um, and then that's when Ben and I connected and we decided to, uh, start sponsoring our own deals. So what, what, um, uh, what got you into investing passively and what was, was there any benefits of doing that other than obviously making return on investment? Um, so in flipping, you're, you're, I have another job. So I'm just, I'm just trading my time for money. 
Um, so I wanted to have some kind of some cash flow coming in. Um, flipping, you don't get any of the tax advantages that you do from investing passively. Um, so we we knew we wanted to do that. We the, with the where the market is right now, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do single family for us, um, and we didn't want to have to manage it ourselves. So we knew we had to go large. At first, we started. We looked at partnering with a few people. Um, we had there was three or four of us that wanted to invest and partner on a deal. Uh, we just really wanted to go. I, I, we were limiting ourselves to about fifty to seventy-five units. We really wanted to get larger even than that, uh, just to be able to have full-time on-site personnel, uh, both as managers and maintenance. And that only really made sense when you could start investing passively in larger deals. Uh, so that's the route we took. Okay. Um, ben, you have a kind of an interesting story. Tell me a little bit about, well, the violin. Was that like a career that you had? Yeah. So I was born in Russia and from the age of like five, I'd been playing the fiddle and that was supposed to be my career. Um, and I, I came to America in 1989, uh, became a citizen, went to the conservatory in Cincinnati, was not quiet. I mean, I don't consider myself a child prodigy, but, you know, maybe kind of like on that spectrum somewhere at the bottom. But then uh, I think it was a first or second year, I don't remember now, of my um master degree at the conservatory just oh, my body went completely nuts and yeah, that's a long conversation we don't want to have it but what it came down to is hey ben maybe it's not the wisest thing for you to rely on fine motor skills such as a violin player to make money well uh my intelligence at that point my 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 intellectual worth at that point was all tied up in music and violin i just hadn't explored any other avenues at that point because i had no idea i always saw myself as a violin player so when that happened and it became quite clear that i couldn't pursue that path and then it was a matter of well what do i do uh and so you know a lot of studying a lot of reading a lot of talking to a lot of different people. I just kind of backed into real estate. The way you introduced me was perfect. MS happened and then real estate just kind of happened. I've never had anybody introduce me that way, but that's exactly what happened. Like in one sentence, MS happened, a lot of other stuff happened in between, but then real estate just kind of happened. And that was, that was it. Um, so Ben with, you know, obviously you've got this uh, skill this that most people don't have. And, you know, you're an excellent violin player. And I, I'm assuming you probably maybe play a little bit still, but uh, that was going to be your, that was going to be how you made your money and, and did your thing. It's kind of, right. you know, this pro sports athlete right. uh, is, is focusing so much on let's call it football or whatever. And they get injured and, and you go, Oh crap. Now what? Right. Uh, right. What, what got you from, from, you know, that depression of like, this is not what I'm going to do. And I don't, maybe you weren't ever like that, but th this is not what I'm going to do. And uh, now what do I do? Like, right. what, where was the motivation there and what, like what, Kind of take me through that a little bit because I think Boy, that's interesting. You're asking very intuitive questions. I don't usually have people ask me this stuff. This is right on, Todd. Um, you know, there's a, there is a, an intersection point where who you are intersects what you are and how you see yourself professionally tees up who you see yourself personally as when you look at yourself in the mirror. Uh, it's a very intelligentsia approach. It's a very Eastern European kind of classical, you know, your socks don't match so you're in tune with the universe kind of thing. But you, you, that's exactly what I was. The, the, there was depression because there's no way there wasn't going to be depression because yeah. 
who I was, was what I was, and what I was was just a rug that just got pulled out from underneath my feet, so I wasn't that anymore. Well, what am I? So it, it wasn't even a question of who am I or what am I? It was everything. It's like the whole identity was tied up in knots and it was gone, okay? So it was a difficult, difficult thing. And I think that the first step in that process, you know, to move on was to realize that who I am has nothing to do with what I do, but it has more to do with how I grow. So I'm to, like today, I pride myself and I pinch myself that I'm so lucky because I have the option and the freedom to only do what I want to do with who I want to do it. Okay. And I never, you're never, you're never going to find me somewhere where I don't want to be. It, perhaps this sounds conceited, but that's what life is about. So everything I do today is because I want to be doing it. It, which is why I do it, which is the essence of growth. So that arrival at that perspective of, okay, you were a musician and that's who you were, but now you're not anymore. You are a teacher here. You are an investor there. You have an online presence and you sell a product online over here. You have a portfolio you own over here. You have syndications you do over there. And you do all those things. Why? Because you outgrow the cup that was you yesterday. So today, the cup from yesterday isn't big enough to fit everything I want to be. So I got to build a bigger cup. And that's what makes life fun for me right now. And that's what also makes it challenging. But that's what allows me not to be depressed or fo you know, to be, be focused on the potential uh, of growth as opposed to the limitations of you know, yesterday or whatever have you. So it's easier to talk about it now because I've internalized it and I can look in the rear view mirror and I see all this imagery. So it's easier to describe to you the imagery. Back in the day, when I was depressed, trying to figure this out, this, this wasn't easy. And it didn't fully formulate until much later. But kind of the, the pointing the nose of that spaceship in that direction, that essence of life is growth beyond where you were today. And as long as you're able to grow, there is everything to look forward to. And it doesn't matter what you do, just grow. Um, I think that's what got me out of the depression and helped me move on. Um, so listeners need to rewind that and re-listen to that because you have some, some pretty powerful quotes in there. <laughs> so I, I thought that was, that was pretty good. Gro growth is you know, going beyond where you are today. I thought that was really good. You, guys, you had a lot of good things there. So I appreciate that. Uh, so Sam, Sam, I want to ask you, you get a CPA job and uh, CPAs, you know, make some good money. What, why'd you go, I want to become a real estate investor. I want to get out of the CPA job. What, was there anything in particular that made that click? It, it didn't start where that wasn't my goal is to leave accounting. Um, it started out something on the side and I realized how much I loved doing my stuff on the side a lot more than what I was doing at work. And if I could scale, it made sense to just do that full time. Um, so it, it was a pretty, definitely a progression and it's not what I set out to do, but it, it boiled down to, I liked doing real estate a whole lot more than sitting at a desk. Yeah. I think that was for me as well as when you're like, when you're going to work and you're thinking about what you're going to do after work with your real estate stuff, you know, it's time, <laughs> it's time to start uh, maybe changing directions there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, cool. Cool. So you guys now are, are, are partners. You closed on uh, I what was it just recently? You closed on a 98 unit. I think it was, is that correct? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Here in Phoenix, a 98 unit. 
Okay. Awesome. And so, and you syndicated that, which is great. I've got a couple questions then on that. So, you know, partnerships can be difficult, can be difficult to find a, a good partner that you can trust. Uh, and also, you know, it's, it's like a, it's like a marriage. I mean, you guys are in this deal together and you have to be able to work together. So first of all, how did you kind of, you know, find maybe each other and then start working together? Where did, when did that trust form and, and kind of just take us through that progression and maybe tips for others who are wanting to get started in business and really like the idea of a partner, but don't really know where to find a partner or how to, how to get going with that. Sam, you want to take it? Sure. Um, so Ben, Ben was, uh, putting together a deal. Um, and I was an investor in that and it, it ended up falling through, but through that deal is when, where Ben and I met and I, we worked a lot. We talked a lot. We had a lot of communications during that deal. Um, and then as soon as that deal fell through, um, the seller basically didn't want to sell it anymore. Um, and so when that happened, I, I decided that I wanted to start getting in sp sponsoring um, a few months before that. Um, and this was actually going to be one of my last passive investments. And so I basically told Ben where I was at and we just, I was going at a conference in Vegas when this happened and Ben was a little down when that happened, when he was going through that and the deal didn't go through. And so we just start, basically started underwriting together. Um, and it's, we didn't know that we were just going to be partners, but we started sending each other deals and we're both in the same city. So it was easy for us to connect. Um, and it just slowly graduate, uh, gradually became a partnership. Um, started flying to different areas of the country, submitting offers, looking at properties. Um, and then our role slowly got defined going through that process. Um, ben can tell you the story of <laughs> probably when we were flying back from, I think it was Indianapolis, <laughs> <laughs> of how we, uh, I, I, it was funny, we were sitting down for a burger. Uh, we were in the highest and best. In a, uh, on a property in Indianapolis, we didn't we didn't get it, but we went out and put boots on the ground and and on the way back we're sitting having a burger at at you know one of the airport joints, and I just I look at Sam and I go because I like him, but let's face it I wouldn't be partnering with him because he's better than me at some of the things, I'm partnering with him because I like him, and I trust him. Uh, but I turned to him and I said, why do you want to partner with me? Uh, I could be an asshole. And he just kind of looked at me very naivishly and says, just don't be an asshole. Be fine. <laughs> <laughs> As for, you know, the way we hooked up, I have a really good friend. His name is Brandon Turner. You probably know him, uh, Bigger Pockets. Yep. And uh, he's the one, I, he's the one that connected us uh, for this deal. Um, but you know, Sam and I met and had lunch and he was going to invest in a deal that didn't, didn't happen. And then just like you said, we just started working together and, um, it's a very interesting dynamic, uh, Todd, because I, you know, I, I'm a smart guy, but I don't have classical training either mathematically or accounting wise. So uh, I'm a musician, I'm an artist. So I tend to think of real estate a little bit more liberal arts. So I've been doing it for a decade and I, I just, I paint stories when I underwrite, whether it's a 20 unit, a four unit or a 200 unit, I underwrite stories and then I boil those stories down to numbers. So, you know, you have LTL, well, you know, it, it is a numerical line item. And it stands for something mathematically, but more importantly, it tells a story of a behavior, set of behaviors at the property. The same is true with vacancy. The same is true with every line item in that underwriting. So I start thinking about things in terms of stories. I look at this project, 
I look at where it is. I look at where it can be. I look who it's going to attract, who's there now, what we can do. And I see this whole picture. And then what I do is I, just the way my mind works, I boil it down to numbers inside those cells in those line items. Okay. Sam is very different. Sam is very computer-like, computer, like mathematical. He, he goes straight to the numbers. Like the numbers are his story, okay? So we start visualizing each property from a little bit of a different focal point. And then it's very interesting how our perspectives marry. So that goes to your question of why does this partnership work and why does it work well? Because we balance each other very well. You know, I have 10, 12 years of experience of dealing with tenants. I know how they behave. I know what happens in their lives. He doesn't have that experience, but he has experience in numbers that I don't have. So it's very interesting dynamic how we arrive at a commonality when looking at the same project. It's working very well. We're able to be very competitive. We were just in the highest and best last week uh, on 164 unit. We were, went through all the way highest and best, went through the telephone conversations. We were, we were one of two standing at the end of the day. We didn't get the property, uh, but... Uh, we're, we're able to be very competitive in this environment with our underwriting. And I think our backgrounds and where we come from and how we look at things a little bit differently and then, you know, synergize those perspectives. That, I think, has a lot to do with why we're able to be competitive. Well, that's that's really cool. I, I, I appreciate uh, you sharing that because um... – your background is definitely a lot different than, than Sam's and, and actually Sam's is probably a lot closer to mine. I'm very analytical. I'm very black and white, like a number is a number. <laughs> one plus one is, 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 you know, two and, and where you're looking at it in a more um, liberal way and, and we can, you know, paint a different picture uh, to say. And so I think that's, that's very interesting. I appreciate you sharing that. And it's not, I am also very analytical at the end. It's, it's a funnel. Yeah. I'm trying to describe to you a funnel, but my funnel doesn't start with numbers at the top. My right. funnel starts with a larger perspective um, of behavior yeah. and interaction of human behavior and property, just because this is, this is how I think about things. At the end of the day, the numbers decide everything. But the numbers are only as good as the inputs that you put in. And where do we get those inputs? What I'm saying is I get my inputs from the story. Sam and you get your inputs differently. I'm not sure how, but that's what makes us different. Yeah, no, and that, that's what makes it work, it sounds like. And, that, yep. and that's the most important part in a partnership is having – different skill sets and different, you know, different uh, things you're going to bring to the table to make it work. So uh, yeah. awesome. Um, what, and this might be probably different from, you know, for each of you, but what's, uh, what's one of the biggest mistakes in business that you've made? And more importantly, how did you learn from it? Take that one, Ben. <laughs> Um, the biggest mistake I made was not listening to my intuition as it relates to people. Like there were transactions I got into that my gut was telling me not to get into because it wasn't going to end well but I did it anyhow. And that's a mistake. So again, maybe something less than mathematical or algorithmic or more liberal arts, but that has been my biggest downfall. Interestingly, I can't change that. 
because today I'm doing the same thing. I'm doing it with Sam. So if, if he screws me, I'll be going on another podcast and saying the same thing, but I don't have my gut telling me not to do it. You know, it's like I, I see the best in people. And business is about people. And I tend to see the best in people, and I want to believe the best in people. And sometimes that's a mistake. And my biggest losses came from, you know, forcing that perspective on myself and on the situation that everything will be fine because people at the end of the day are inherently good and behave honorably, which is just not the case all the time. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I actually <laughs> dealing with us, that right now is, is I, my intuition said after I met uh, these people said not to do business with them to walk away, and but I was in a position where I needed it was you know somebody to manage my properties, uh, I needed it, and so the, I moved forward with it and it ended up being a, a definitely bad. <laughs> <laughs> I had to fire them and they caused a lot of problems. So, uh, and it happens, uh, oftentimes our intuition is, is correct. Absolutely. Yeah. So, for, Sam, for me, how about you? Yeah. Yeah. So mine would be, I, I waited too long to get started. So I, I feel like I have to control every variable. I have to learn every aspect of it before I get started. And Finally, I mean, after about a year of that, I finally just realized I need to take the leap of faith and do my first deal. Um, and that year was when the market was hot and it was only getting hotter. And I, I, yeah, it would have been a lot different if I had started a year earlier when there was a bigger market increase than when I got started. Um, uh, so just not feeling that I had to be totally prepared. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you need to be educated and know what you're doing, but know that you can't control everything. And there's the best way to learn is just getting out there and doing it. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Re ready, fire, fire, aim, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. Hey, I want to interrupt this episode real quick to talk to you about Nate Armstrong. Uh, our sponsor, Nate Armstrong, he's with homeinvest.com. And you want to get to know Nate. So go to homeinvest.com and just connect with Nate. Talk to him. Learn about his operation, what he's got going on. He's a turnkey provider and it may not be right for you, but it could be the perfect fit. So it doesn't hurt. It's a free call, free consultation just to figure out, you know, what they do, what they have to offer. And worst case is you're going to meet a great person who's really well educated in real estate. He's done a ton of different real estate strategies and probably he's gonna teach you a little bit even on a short conversation uh, with him. So go to homeinvest.com and, and uh, connect with Nate's company. You're definitely not gonna be disappointed, it's worth it. So uh, thanks and we'll get back to our show. So this 98 unit, I wanna cover that a little bit. Uh, Tell me a little bit about the, the deal, if you can, or what, what can you tell me about it, I guess? And uh, why did you like it? Why did you have been buying it? Well, we can tell you everything you want to know. I mean, it's pretty public. We have posted, uh, I mean, I wrote about it on my side. We posted all over Bigger Pockets. There's, there's just a huge thread on it. So um, we're, we're pretty open about all the details on it. It's a big value add. Um, which is, you know, the only kind of things that we're interested in. Uh, it, it is, it's, it's in Phoenix. First of all, I think, you know, if we're going to have like a serious or a semi-serious conversation about syndication uh, or large apartments, we need to start out with the market because you just can't do this stuff anywhere. You, and by this stuff, I mean, take people's money, hard earned money, people who trust you and put it in a market that is subpar that you don't believe in with everything you got. And there's only a few markets that are real growth markets 
specifically late in the cycle as we are, that reasonably you should be trying to do this. So Sam and I like Phoenix. Um, we can have a conversation about why, but that's where we would start is it's in Phoenix. It is also in the part of Phoenix that is uh, earlier on the curve or later on the curve, I should say, than, um, than the rest of Phoenix. And Phoenix itself is behind national trends on many of the metrics. So uh, that would be the starting point. And then the deal itself is a, it was a very mismanaged uh, property. Uh, a lot of value add we're putting in between twelve and thirteen thousand dollars a door between interior and exterior. This is a full renovation. We're touching practically everything, um, but we're we're bumping rents by very significant amounts. And so far, uh, we've only had it for about two months. But early indicators are that we're hitting our projected. Uh, after renovation goals. And we're doing better on physical vacancy. We're doing better on economic vacancy. Uh, so, so far, so good. And, and the reason we like this deal also is it's near Grand Canyon University, which is going through quite a big transformation right now, um, easily doubling their size every five years uh, in student enrollment. So uh, 10 years ago, they were at 1,000. Now they're at 20,000 and they want to be about at 30,000 students in the next five years. Um, so, so that area is just, just getting a ton of renovation going on. Um, I mean, they're spending a billion dollars to renovate the campus, um, joining D Division One Athletics. So we're just half a mile from there and we just like what's going on in that area. Um, so actually a lot of the deals that we've been looking at lately are within 10 minutes of of this university. Um, and that, that was one of the bigger things that drew us to the property. Um, funny enough, all of the leases that we've been getting, rents that Ben mentioned that we were getting the rents that we were uh, underwrote, and we're all getting that from current tenants. So we haven't even, we're hitting our business plan and we haven't even started drawing those students and or anything from that area. Um, so we just, we really like what that area and with plenty of upside beyond what we've been able to underwrite. So, I mean, that's, you guys are putting a lot of money, you're saying 10 to 13,000. I mean, that, that's, that's a lot of money per unit. Um, how many units have you actually been able to renovate in such a short time? So, so we just started, it took about a, a month to get the, the final scope down for the interior uh, units of the units. Um, we've done three so far. Uh, four are under construction right now, under renovation, um, and we plan to do about four or five a month. And so are, are you, how, what are you doing to keep your occupancy up? Are you, are you removing tenants or are you just waiting? So we're doing it on turnover, on just standard turnover. So it, it actually doesn't increase your, if, as, as long as you can do it within two or three weeks on a return, uh, on this renovation, it actually doesn't increase your uh, physical vacancy at all. So you so, so vacancy, yeah. That's where we back into the numbers because that's the easiest way to paint the pictures with the numbers, right? So mm -hmm. if you take 100 units and you take a vacancy of 5%, okay, that's five units per month. Yep. That's 60 units per year. That means that within about a year and a half to year and three quarters, you are working your way through with just a stabilized 5% vacancy, you're able to get your hands on five units per month. Our business plan calls for about four to five units per month. So our business plan doesn't really call for a higher vacancy at all. And we're not seeing, we're, we're, we're never really seeing anything more than four or five units and that's rare a lot of uh you know a lot of weeks over the last two and a half months we're running with two units vacant so out of the four units that are being renovated now two are already pre-leased 
to existing tenants. Yeah, and, and this is actually helps keep it down as well. We, we've had tenants come in and say, can I move out for two or three weeks? You come in and renovate it and I'll come back in. So that really keeps your vacancy down. And, and so then they're prepared to pay that higher rent as well. Yeah, um, I mean, some of them are going up $500 in rent just because they were so below market before. Yeah, I think it's an interesting uh, thing. A lot of people are frightened to raise rents too much on tenants, which, you know, it's, uh, I, I can understand their philosophy, but when you buy a property such as the one you bought where rents are so much below value right. and, and also the, the units sounds like are very outdated. Uh, they need a lot of work the tenants are happy to see if that work gets done and these, the, they look nice. They want to stay in that community because they see a lot of positives happening and they still know the, the rent that they're going to pay, even though they're paying it way higher than before, it's, it's still right in line with the market. They know if they move somewhere else, they're going to have to pay the same price anyway. Exactly. And, and it was important the way we did it. So we, we were spending about 600,000 on the exterior um, and amenities. So we started immediately by doing the landscaping, repainting, putting new, we're getting new signage up, redoing the laundry facility. They see all this and they just know that it's going to be a better place. Um, so they, they want to stick around and they want to come in and ask us if they can rent, we can renovate their units. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When they see those changes out their window every day and when they walk out to go to their car and they see all these changes happening, uh, that gets them excited about staying at the property. And then, you know, not everybody's going to stay, but a lot more people are willing to stay when you do stuff like that, especially uh, good tenants that, that, you know, are willing to pay and, and can't yeah. afford to pay, of course. Yeah, I've, I've found that in, in several properties we've done the same thing. I mean, I had tenants that were paying 300 bucks a month for rent and you raise it up to five or 600 and and they just go, wow, I, I've been waiting for this day. <laughs> and they stay. They've been expecting it for years and, and they you know, wonder why it hasn't happened in the last 20 years. They haven't had their rent raised and so they're ready for yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, What's uh what's advice you would either of you would give our listeners for operating a business successfully? What are maybe maybe each of you share two key uh, things that you think are are important for operating a business successfully? Sam, go ahead. Um, one thing I would say is be consistent. So when so there's days where you just don't feel like especially when you're a, you're a business owner and you're on your own and uh, you're your own boss, there's some days where I might not feel like underwriting, um, but you don't know what deals are going to come through that day. And it could be the one that was better than the last 10 days. So just being consistent, having a partner uh, like Ben, we just were able to push each other and stay on each top of each other. And that's helped us be consistent. Um, that, that's probably my biggest key to having a good business. Um, having systems and staying organized is another one. Um, especially when you're dealing with, on this last one, we closed in 45 days. Um, and you, you're just, there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of stuff you have to get to a, a lender um, or a title and keeping everything organized and knowing exactly where everything is and having systems in place um, definitely helps out a ton. Uh, my last one would probably be using professionals as much as you can. Um, we, we debated at the beginning of that, of this deal of whether or not we wanted to use a, a mortgage broker. And I can say they're worth every penny. Um, because I mean, their job is to close that deal and they don't get paid if it doesn't close. Um, and you lose a lot of money as a sponsor personally, if that deal doesn't close. Uh, so it, it's just worth it as insurance to use professionals uh, that can help you along with the process and don't go at it your own, on your own. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. So from, and this is a conversation that I was just having with my wife yesterday or day before. I don't 
believe that you can be all things to all people equally good at everything you have to be good at in order to be successful all the time consistently. Yeah. I don't believe that's possible. Um, step one, recognize this and recognize your limitations. Step two, figure out how you're going to use other people and their expertise. Um, I didn't used to be big on partnerships. I really, I really wasn't. When I would buy a building, I would not do a partnership. I would do debt financing and put somebody in second place and they write a check. And we, I, I used to do things this way. I believe that being in control of everything was the, the best way and the only way. I don't believe that because exponential growth, which is what it really takes. It takes exponentiality in order for you to be happy. Exponential growth requires you to grow much more than humanly possible if you try to do it on your own. So I now am a big proponent of partnerships. However, I believe you have to partner with someone who is better than you at something that you are not great at. You have to know enough to be dangerous. But as I look back, whether it's the internet business or it's the syndication business or anything else that I've done that has succeeded at any point, I may have been the catalyst in some ways, but the reason it succeeded is because I surrounded myself by capable, independent, self, you know, self, whatever, initiating people, whatever I'm trying to say. They don't, you know, they don't need me to hold their hand. In a lot of ways, they'll hold my hand because that's why they're there. That's why I put them there. So it takes us back to the conversation of partnership. Why is a partnership good? Well, that's exactly why it's good. Sam's right. You know, it's like some days you just don't want to, you know, you need a kick in the ass. Who, who else is going to do it? Yeah, especially when you're running your own business and you're, it's just you. It's pretty easy to, you know, who, like you said, who's going to do it? It's, you've got to be self-motivating yourself, which you can be. Uh, but if you've got other people holding you accountable, it's just much easier. Yep. Um, what's uh Ben, what's a favorite book? The book that started everything for me in real estate investing years and years ago is by Oh, geez. How I turned 5,000 into a million or something like that. How I turned 1,000 into a million, something like that. Uh, it, it's a flipping book. It's not even a rental book. Uh, but it, it put my thoughts in the right direction. I'm going to let Sam go as I think really hard about who the author was. It's on the tip of my tongue and I can't remember. Um, for me, it was probably when I, to get into apartments, I read, uh, it was buy, uh, the complete guide to buying and selling apartment buildings. And I think by Steve Burgess, um, that one, that one just completely changed my mindset on it, um, on the approach of apartments and what you could do with them. Um, and it, it, it's not a guide to how you're going to do it, but it just kind of just whets your appetite enough to know what you don't know. That sits on my, sits on my bookshelf. Yeah. Okay. How I turned 1000 into 5 million in my spare time, William Nickerson. It's a very old book. I don't even know if they republish it nowadays. I remember I got it off the shelf at the library, but what it taught me is the, the concept of bridging. So you do this deal, you grow a little equity, you bridge it into the next deal, you grow a little equity. And I, it's very, very primitive. Um, but it's conceptually, 
It's very powerful. It was very powerful for me. Awesome. Um, so last question before we kind of wrap up, I'm going to, this is going to be for each of you. So I'll have eat both of you guys go. Um, what are your three pillars of wealth creation? So Sam, why don't you start us off? Wow. Um, let's say, I would say you need cash flow. Um, so every, a lot of people say you get wealth from appreciation. And I, I think they're both important. But in my mind, cash flow gives you staying power to be able to realize that appreciation. If you don't have cash flow, you're going to have to sell before you want to, uh, through, whether through a CapEx cycle or a market downturn, and you're not going to be able to realize that appreciation. Um, so I say, I'd say those are two big pillars that go hand in hand um, to be able to give you wealth creation. Um, another one, I would say uh, tax strategies. Um, so minimizing your tax strategy, I mean, exponentially be able, allows you to increase your wealth over time. Perfect. Dan? So it's interesting because... Sam had <laughs> equity, but no cash flow. Yeah. I had cash flow, but very little equity. And so <laughs> that's why this marriage, Todd, works so well because we understand each other. And as is, it seems with everything, we're coming at it from different perspectives. Yep. So I realized that cash flow is fool's game because you can't make enough cash flow to support future CapEx without appreciation. And when I started in Ohio, it was just like, I have, I have a nice building, a nice cash flow, but when the furnace goes out, there goes $3,000. How much of my future cash flow did I just pay out for this furnace? And that's okay if the building is appreciated by 10,000. I don't feel bad about it. But if the building hasn't appreciated by 10,000, then I feel like I'm throwing good money after bad. And that's, that's where it, it really became clear to me that wealth is equity. You can't get there without cash flow, but you can't keep your cash flow without equity either. And so those two are absolutely necessary. They go hand in hand. You can't separate them. Stable cash flow only is stable if it's backed up by an asset, which is an appreciating asset, because an appreciating asset is an appreciating asset for a number of reasons. The market is recognizing its appreciation for a reason. It doesn't happen in space. It doesn't happen for no reason, right? So my three pillars are you have to have cash flow. You have to have equity, appreciation. And you have to have diversification, and I would almost say arbitrage between asset classes, business classes, things like that, because things go through cycles and the cycles don't line up. So I, I, I would, you know, I am building and we are, and I'm involving Sam and in some of it, and I have built cash flows that, that are different and they come from different places and the different asset classes. And I think that's important because there has to be some kind of arbitrage and, and those things are decoupled to a large extent. So there's more stability. So I told you that was going to be my last question, but my next question is <laughs> what, what are some of those, um, what are some of those things that you're, that you're doing or building that you, that you're able to talk about? Well, I mean, I've had a website for a decade now and I've taught people real estate. I haven't had, I, I never did podcast. Um, I was, I did kind of a small podcast before anybody else was doing it, before anybody knew what podcast was. And then by the time I kind of thought maybe I should do a podcast, everybody else was doing one. So I just kind of said, eh, whatever. But I've been, uh, for instance, uh, on my website, I've been selling a product for probably eight years, a course on real estate, an introductory course called CFFU. Um, quite a few people 
purchase the course. It's a few hundred dollars. It's, it's not expensive. Most of the people that buy are BPers. Uh, that provides some revenue that's completely decoupled from what I do in real estate. My wife is a licensee. She does very well for herself. She sells property. She's, you know, she's a real estate agent, a, a, a realtor. Um, I have a portfolio that I own in Ohio that I bought that I still own most of it in Ohio, which is the cash flow play. It's never going to appreciate beyond the point of the value add that I did, but you know, I'm not losing money on it and it's uh, cash flow. It's very stable. It's predictable. It is what it is. Okay. Nothing glamorous, but it is what it is. I do syndication because I think it's important. The velocity of money is important. Nobody thinks about velocity of money ever. And what occurred to me a few years back is that in order to be in a healthy circumstance, you have to have a certain tapestry of cash flow where some of the velocity, some of the, some of that cash flow is like a little rug, like a magic carpet that's slow and it's just, it's just consistent and slow. And, and, and on top of it, here and there, you have these bags of money, these bombs of money that are coming in, right? So, you know, whether it's a syndication fee to do that, or it's, you're selling the building and you're getting paid from the sale of a building. So capital gains or whatever, but I need an asset class which can facilitate those big bombs. Okay. So you have slow and steady cash flow and you have the big bombs for Sam. He does flips. He'll do a couple of flips a year and that's his big bag of cash aside for syndication. Right. Um, Together, we're putting a syndication event on in Phoenix. And that was an interesting thing because for me, it started with, um, I wanted to see if I could automate my charitable giving. So like, you know, my wife and I donate money to kids' school and this and that and the other. And you always feel like you're not doing enough, but this is like what you're comfortable doing because you're dipping into your pocket and you're stroking a check and this is... You know, you can only do what you can do. So my perspective on things is that, like if you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he says, buy an asset over here. This asset throws off some money. You can spend that money on a do dad because it's not coming out of your pocket. So as long as you offset a do dad with an asset, which pays for it, it's okay. My perspective takes it one step further and says, hey, if you want to do that, are you original enough to look at that doodad and ask yourself, how can I twist this thing upside down so it becomes its own asset? Yes, I want it, but I can't afford to pay for it. So how can I pay for itself? Because if I can get it, if I can rig it somehow to where it can pay for itself, then I can have it. it doesn't cost me anything to have it. Well, if I wanna donate more money to charity, if I create a business model which incorporates my charitable giving as one of the expenses, operating costs, just comes out of it, the more money the business enterprise makes, the more money I can donate to charity. And so the first place we're starting is I shared this with Sam and he thought it was a cool idea. So we're putting together Phoenix Syndication Workshop. It's going to be in January. And we're going to do an event and, you know, we, we rented a space for 150 people. And if we can put 150 people in the hole, we're going to write a check to a hero's home. That's uh, Jay Heinrich and uh, Burke, their charity. We're going to write a check to them for, I don't know, thirty forty thousand dollars cool. $40,000. And that's gratifying, yeah. you know, so, there's a lot of lessons. They should probably rewind that and re-listen to that because there's a lot of interesting stuff in that. But yeah, it's important to be diversified. And some of the some of the things you're involved in are going to be slow and steady cash flow. Other things you do are going to be big, you know, big bombs here and there once or twice a year. 
other things you do are just going to build your balance sheet. So you have to take care of all of the above. Yep, absolutely. Well, it wouldn't be politically correct if I didn't give Sam another opportunity to talk. So, so, so Sam, <laughs> is there anything you're working on right now that you're excited about? Um, well, first, I want to say thank you, Ben, for you might have doubled the amount of times I've heard do that in my life. Yeah, I've never, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't remember the last time I heard that word. When, you, yeah. when he first said it, I'm like, what, what did he say? Did he swear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, anything else I'm working on? Um, the, the, just flips on the side. The biggest thing, uh, we've been remodeling our house for the past year, and I'm happy to get that finally done. I feel like I'm going to have a ton of free time once this is done. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, not too much, uh, other than just planning this workshop that Ben just mentioned. Cool. Awesome. Well, Hey, I appreciate both of you guys, uh, coming on and I need to get some contact information on, on how we can get the listeners to your syndication conference. So make sure uh, you give us a, maybe you already have that. We can just mention it right now. Otherwise we'll put it on the show notes. Um, and then how else can our listeners get in touch with you? Uh, for me, uh, you can go to whitehavencapital.com. Um, and then for the, uh, the event, uh, Ben's hosting uh, the event page on his website, justaskbenwhy.com slash phoenix. Justaskbenwhy.com. Yep. Forward slash phoenix. Forward yeah. slash phoenix. And my email is ben at just ask ben why .com. Awesome. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate you being on the show, taking time uh, from your day and lots of, lots of awesome value that you guys brought. Yep. Thanks for having us, Todd. It's a pleasure to be with you. But before we get on, can I give everybody Sam telephone number? <laughs> so that <laughs> everyone Wait, can call, ask questions. <laughs> 419. <laughs> Todd, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, th thanks, guys. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks, you Thank too. You. A special thanks to Sam Grooms and Ben Leibovich. Appreciate them joining us on the show and the valuable insight they've been able to give us. First of all, a couple things I took from them. One is to be consistent. Obviously, extremely important. Be consistent. Make sure that you're always uh, continuing to push forward. Uh, number two is to talk about, uh, you know, having systems and being organized and, you know, growing and developing those systems, changing them when needed, but making sure you have that in place. And then the last thing is don't try to be all things to all people. Uh, and that's really important. That's something that, that I struggle with. A lot of people struggle with is, is we want to be people pleasers. We want to um, try to do everything ourselves. Uh, but it's important to make sure that you're, you know, you're delegating, that you're not trying to be everything to everybody, uh, that you're getting the right people in place uh, for your company in order to grow. So uh, awesome advice. Great podcast. Appreciate them being part of the show again. And uh, be part of the event they got coming up. Uh, go to justaskbenwhy.com forward slash phoenix. Uh, you can also connect with them at whitehavencapital.com. We'll put that into the show notes. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think it, it'd be valuable. Go, go to their event, check it out, and uh, do some networking. Meet Ben and Sam. Thanks a lot for joining me on Pillars of Wealth Creation. And go onto our Facebook page. Check our Facebook page out, Pillars of Wealth uh, on Facebook and make sure you go onto iTunes. If you haven't already gone to iTunes, go there, give us a five-star rating review, well, hopefully five stars, and let us, just let us know what you're thinking, what you like, uh, same thing on Facebook or, uh, or YouTube. You can reach out, you can send us a note. I'm Todd Dykeshammer, signing off. Make every day set. Are you ready to start investing in real estate today, but don't know where to start? Sometimes investing can seem way too complicated, but it actually couldn't be any easier than with homeinvest.com. You know the co-founder and my friend, Nate Armstrong. He appeared on episode 20, and if you haven't heard it, go back and listen to it, episode number 20. 
Home Invest is a company that allows you to invest in turnkey real estate. Their goal is to build powerful investment tools that make real estate investing accessible to everyone. They have contractors and property managers available for you with the click of your mouse. While other real estate agents can only offer a property, Home Invest brings you a full turnkey package that allows you to diversify your investments, earn passive income and start building equity in properties. Their simple intuitive design allows newcomers and experienced investors alike to hit the ground running and to be able to choose the properties when they want and where they want. View easy to understand charts and data to allow you to buy in only a few clicks or just a simple phone call. With Home Invest, you'll be building your portfolio as quickly or as slowly as you would like. And right now, Home Invest is giving our listeners, Pillar of Wealth Creation listeners, a free course on how to finally win in real estate investing. So go to homeinvest.com forward slash pillars. That's homeinvest.com forward slash pillars to claim your free course today.